So hello and welcome back again to BISP Solutions. Uh, my name is Anjali and let's start with our session today. Uh, yesterday we saw the basics of how a custom PBCS application works and what uh, what is the usage of creating a custom PBCS application, right? So moving ahead uh, with today's session in which uh, we are going to understand few balance sheet drivers and how these balance sheet drivers are useful in decision making. Then we are also going to understand some accounting ratios and its application in analysis of entities position. Right, so let's get started with today's session. Uh, so basically the purpose of corporate finance is to maximize shareholders wealth. We all are very much aware about this, right? So maximizing shareholders wealth requires asset management, investment management and financing management. Sometimes corporate finance is managing as is assets in place. Sometimes corporate finance is managing what it believes the future may hold so it may properly position itself today and investment and future growth opportunities and to execute asset investment and financing decision making. We must accurately assess both parts of our fundamental valuation equation, right? So valuation is a concept which is a forward looking concept. So therefore, both the cash flow and the returns require forecast figures. Forecast figures require a base of observation from which to draw inferences for the estimation of future events and circumstances. Internally, our base of observations are our historic statements. The inferences are our drivers. These drivers are most often expressed as ratios, like we can say as percentage of X amount or adjusted actuals. If you want to adjust that particular amount with growth, so we can adjust that or it can be a combination of both. So drivers must be based on proven relationships which have stood the test of time and must be adjusted as warranted. So this basically combines the fundamental storm weathered statement analysis technique and subject matter expertise. So this is the topic and this is the point which we are going to discuss uh, today in our custom PBCS application. All right, in which I'm going to tell you uh, what are the drivers we have in our balance sheet. We are going to calculate few drivers and uh, read about all the drivers, why it is used, how it is used and its analysis part and all about the ratios. So let's get started with our today's session quickly without me wasting much of our time. So this is my home page for uh, this is my PBCS interface for uh, custom application PBCS custom application. So we'll go straight away to the navigator and I will tell you about what are the dimensions we have and what are the balance sheet drivers I have used in this custom application. All right, so in this account uh, dimension, let's uh, click our cube. My cube is plan one and dimension is account. So in accounts, we have various drivers which I have given for my calculation part. All right. So in balance sheet drivers, I have used DSO, which stands for daily sales outstanding. Then we have days in inventory. Then we have prepaid expense percentage of OPEX, which means the operating expense. Then we have accrued expense, which is the percentage of operating expense. Accrued compensation, which is, which is a percentage of total compensation, then DPO, which stands for daily payables outstanding and number of days in periods. So all these drivers have some member formula attached to it, which we are going to run and we are going to see what figures we are getting and what does these figures show about the entity's position, right? So. These are the drivers. Uh, of balance sheet, which I just discussed. All right, so the first one which uh, for which we are going to talk about is DSO, which means daily sales outstanding. So before going into the application part and understanding and calculating the figures uh, relating to these drivers and ratios, there, it is very necessary. We must understand the 
kind of uh, ratios and drivers we are using. So let's get familiar with all the drivers and all the ratios which we'll be using in our custom PBCS application. All right, so I have saved these links for you so that it is easy for us to understand all the drivers. All right, so let's get started with first driver which I'm using over here, it, which is DSO, which is Daily Sales Outstanding. The first one is daily sales, say, uh, daily day sales outstanding, right? So day sales outstanding or DSO refers to the average number of days a business takes to collect its receivables after a sale. It is considered a popular metric by diverse industries to estimate their financial health. As I already told you at the beginning of this session, these are all the financial drivers which the industries use to analyze uh, and make decisions based on it. So usually this is measured by calculating the number of days it takes to convert credit sales to cash. Let's say the DSO of a business is 30 days, which means it has recovered its receivables or dues in 30 days. So we need to understand how this DSO which means days sales outstanding is calculated. So here it is given an example while various industries follow different approaches to calculate their daily sales, uh, daily sales outstanding day sales outstanding. The simple formula to calculate the DSO is accounts receivables, whatever the total amount of accounts receivable an entity have then divided by the net credit sales multiplied by the number of days. All right, so this is the basic formula which the industries use for calculating the day's sales outstanding. And I'll also show you that uh, this formula in our application, how I have created this formula using the member formula in our application. All right, so this is the example of DSO in which a company makes around $30,000 credit sales and $20,000 accounts receivables in 40 days. Now let's calculate its DSO. So we have already learned the formula. It is total accounts receivables divided by net credit sales multiplied by number of days. So it is basically telling us that DSO for business as like in this example, we just read out if the BS, uh, DSO of the business is 30 days, which means it has recovered it receivables or dues in 30 days. So in this, the receivables, uh, accounts receivables in 40 days they receive it in 40 days time cycle all right so the formula of calculating it is 20000 which is the accounts receivables divided by net credit sales which is 30000 multiplied by 40 so it comes to 26.6 days this means a company has recovered its dues in 26.6 days and that its dso is 26.6 days that's great because if a business has DSO below 45 days, it indicates a low DSO. All right, so we need to keep this in mind. A business with low DSO implies it has promptly paying customers and that its cash flow is stable. All right, it is not increasing. So it is showing that your cash flow is becoming stable. So how to calculate monthly DSO? So let's say this company A makes $20,000 worth of credit sales in a month and receives around $16,000 as receivables. So it will the monthly DSO will be $16,000, which is which it receives around as receivables, $16,000 it receives uh, as receivables. So $16,000 divided by its credit sales. So divided by 20,000 and multiplied by 30. All right, because 30, because we have 30 days in a month. All right, so multiplied by 30. So it's monthly DSO will be 24. It is important to note that we consider only credit sales while calculating the DSO. Cash sales are said to have a DSO of zero because they don't affect, affect the accounts receivable or the time taken to recover the dues. All right, because in the cash sales, the money is instantly received. There is no credit sales. All right. So why it is a critical metric? Why the industries use it for their decision making? 
because it is a it determines the financial situation and growth. It also signifies how good a business is at recovering its parts dues. Suppose a business takes longer than 45 days, it has to streamline its collections process to convert orders to cash in fewer days. DSO offers insights to the following. Are the customers paying back on time? The operational liquidity of the business, the total number of sales in a certain period, the customer relationships, overall performance of the accounts receivable team, collective team's efficiency and how to optimize the payment policy and strategy. It is easier to evaluate the financial health after weighing all these factors together. All right, so this is basically telling us what does a high DSO and what does a low DSO means. All right, so what is a high DSO? In simple words, a high DSO indicates that a business takes more days to collect its dues. This could be because of two reasons. Either the business lacks customers who pay on time or its collection procedure is inefficient. A business with high DSO often fails to convert orders to cash and in some cases it writes off the payment as a bad debt. As a result, this could lead to unstable financial health. Moving ahead with what is a low DSO? A low DSO suggests a business collects its debts within its payment time and has prompt paying customers. It also indicates that the business has an efficient collection process and a proactive collection team. And this that is what leads to a lower DSO and helps a business recover past due seamlessly. When a business has a low DSO, it also guarantees inflow of operational liquidity that can be used for other high value functions. All right, so you can all read about this more to understand about this driver. There's a short um, note over written, uh, written over here which says how to improve DSO. So you have various methods to improve the DSO. So it can be offer discounts to early paying customers, analyze risky customers and strategize accordingly, then accept the payments in your customer's preferred payment mode, invest in an automated system. So these are the few points by which you can improve the DSO. Then how to forecast accounts receivables using DSO. There is a method for which, uh, by which you can forecast accounts receivables. So it helps in predicting future payments and cash flow. This is usually quantified by analyzing your customer's payment history. You can easily forecast your accounts receivable using DSO. So here is how you can do that. First is sales forecast. Begin with forecasting your sales and you can determine this time this by examining your past month's sales. While forecasting this, you may want to consider various factors like customer retention or attrition, signing up new customers, economy, price changes, etc. Then we have calculate days sales outstanding. We have already discussed the DSO calculation formula. So using that, you can calculate your DSO and figure out how long your customer takes to fulfill the payment. Then forecast accounts receivables. Now that we have the sales forecast and the DSO calculation, we can forecast the accounts receivables. The formula to calculate the accounts receivables is daily sales outstanding multiplied by sales forecast divided by time. All right, so this is how you can calculate it. Okay, so if this is a simple example based on the point which we just discussed that if a company has a sales forecast of around dollar twenty thousand in thirty days and DSO is twenty, so what will be the accounts receivable? The formula is daily sales outstanding. All right, multiplied by the sales forecast divided by time. So sales forecast is twenty thousand. Time is 30 days and the daily sales outstanding is 20. Just give me a minute.
all right so let's get started with our further discussion so this was all about the dso the second driver which we are going to discuss today is days in inventory all right so we have an article relating to the days in inventory part so let's read that out so we have formula for calculating the days in inventory with three examples they have given so calculating the days in inventory tells you how quickly a company can sell its inventory for money if you are looking then uh, you have take key takeaways that so um, here if you are looking for a job in finance or accounting being familiar with how to calculate days in inventory can give you skills to succeed in the field like knowing formulas and how to analyze the result all right so in this article we explore how to calculate days in inventory and discuss why it's important So what are the key takeaways? Days in inventory is the average time a company keep its inventory before it is sold. To calculate days in inventory, divide the cost of average inventory by the cost of goods sold and multiply that by the period length which is usually 365 days. Calculating days in inventory can help show whether a company is operating efficiently or not. Right? So what is days in inventory it is an average time a company keeps its inventory before they sell it as we have already discussed this so basically this is telling us that a low days in inventory figure can indicate the company is exchanging its products for cash cash quickly and that they are operating efficiently if a company finds that its uh, that its conversion through sales is slow this can show which areas might need additional help such as building or revising a brand image or adapting to changes in the industry then we have a formula also to calculate the days in inventory so it is average inventory divided by the cost of goods sold multiplied by the period length all right in this period length refers to the amount of time you want to calculate the days in inventory for this number is often 365 for the number of days in one year then average inventory is the number of units a business typically holds in inventory then cost of goods sold is the money required to produce the products in company's inventory all right then uh, based on this inventory days in inventory inventory we calculate the inventory turnover ratio so this article also tells us about the inventory turnover ratios which describes any product that a company sells and then replaces the turnover ratio measures how efficiently a company sells its inventory and the formula for the inventory uh, inventory ratio is cost of goods sold divided by the inventory so there are five steps to calculate the inventory in which we find the average inventory then the cal, uh, cash uh, cost of goods sold then the period length then we divide the average inventory by the cost of goods sold and multiply the number of days the result by the number of days in the period all right so this was all about the inventory in days all right now moving ahead with our another driver which is prepaid expense so basically we are going to talk about dso days in inventory prepaid expense dpo number of days in periods all right then we have prepaid expense so as we all are very well aware of that what are the prepaid expenses just let's brush up our knowledge for prepaid expenses so these are the future expenses that are paid in advance in short if we uh, uh, understand its meaning it these are the future expenses that are paid in advance such as rent or insurance on the balance sheet prepaid expenses are first recorded an, as an asset and as the benefits of the assets are realized over time the amount is then recorded as an expense 
so they have just given us the meaning of what are the prepaid expense assets what are the benefits of prepaid expenses and what its prepaid expense amortization how are they recorded and how where do prepaid expenses appear on the balance sheet so basically it appears on the uh, balance sheet side as a current asset unless the period expense prepaid expense will not be incurred within 12 months all right so once expenses incur the prepaid asset account is record is reduced and an entry is made to the expense account on the income statement then they have given the examples of prepaid expenses prepaid insurance prepaid rent and all sort of things relating to the prepaid expenses all right so now we will read this article and understand what is dpo so daily days pay payable outstanding is a financial ratio that indicates the average time in days that a company takes to pay its bill and invoices to its trade creditors which may help which may include suppliers vendors or financiers the ratio is typically calculated on a quarterly or annual basis at and it indicates how well the company's cash flows are being managed a company with a higher dpo takes longer to pay its bills which means that it can retain available funds for a longer duration allowing the company an opportunity to use those funds in a better way to maximize the benefits a high dpo however may also be a red flag indicating an inability to pay its bills on time so what are the key takeaways that it computes the average number of days a company needs to pay its bills and obligations companies that have a high dpo can delay making payments and use the available cash for short term investments as well as to increase their working capital and free cash flow however higher values of dpo though desirable may not always be a positive for the business as it may signal a cash short shortfall and inability to pay dpo often varies by industry or company size as larger companies often have more negotiation power to delay when the payments are due dpo is a turnover ratio that calculates how efficiently a company is operating and using resources so here we have the formula for calculating the days payable outstanding which is accounts payable divided by the cost of goods sold multiplied by the number of days and cost of goods sold is calculated by beginning inventory plus the purchases minus minus, minus the ending inventory all right so this is how you calculate the dpo and then you can read further about this article and uh, on dpo now we have number of days in period this is also a driver which is used in our calculation so in balance sheet when we are doing the driver based planning and then we, when we click on days in period and then enter the amount of days in each collection period all right so this is just used for entering the uh, number of days in each collection period all right now taking our discussion ahead with accounting ratios in which we are going to study few accounting ratios uh, like gross margin ratio current ratio working capital uh, return on invested capital and debt to equity ratio all right so let's start with gross margin ratio let me just show you in our application also we have these kind of ratios let me just show you so as you can see on my screen that i have discussed these drivers with you now we are moving ahead with discussing the ratios and how these ratios are used i have just used few ratios which are useful uh, rest all are also useful but we are just discussing few uh, so that it does not takes lot of time and we the main concept of uh, this is understanding the point in analysis and decision making why we use these ratios right so let's go ahead with ratios part and understand first the gross margin ratio
So what is gross margin ratio? It is a financial ratio that compares gross revenue from sale of a product or service with the cost of making or delivering that product known as the cost of goods sold. So cost of goods sold include any expense directly related to manufacturing a product or delivering a service. It does not include indirect costs like administrative expenses, overhead costs or sales costs. By comparing gross sales revenue to direct expenses, a company can learn about its own efficiency or lack thereof. The gross margin ratio is also known as a gross profit margin ratio or gross profit ratio. It is one of the major profitability ratios used in the corporate accounting along with the net profit margin and operating margin. So how do you calculate the gross margin ratio? The total revenue minus the cost of goods sold and divided by the total revenue of that product. So this produces a ratio that can be converted to a percentage that reflects whether, a, whether or not a company is efficiently manufacturing its product offering. A high gross margin ratio indicates efficiency and a lower gross margin ratio indicates uh, efficiency suggests a process that could be improved. For example, imagine a shoe company that earns a gross profit of $28.7 million from sales of its athletic sneakers. The company carries a cost of goods sold that totals $19.248 million, which includes raw materials, factory equipment and employee salaries. When plugged into gross margin ratio formula, these number looks like like this. OK, so this yields a gross margin ratio of 0 0.32933 multiplied by 100, which is converted to a percentage will come to 32.9 percent profit margin. All right, so there is a difference between gross profit and net profit, which they have clearly mentioned. You can read this out the difference between gross margin and not net profit margin ratios. All right, so what makes a good gross margin ratio? So as a general rule, higher gross profit margin indicates more profitable company. A high ratio suggests that a company is not spending too much of its revenues on production expenses like salaries and raw materials. In real world practice, different industries operate at different gross margin ratios. The banking industry has a famously high gross, gross profit margin. Uh, while the airline industry operates at notoriously low profit margins, roughly 6%. Notably, high gross, uh, gross profit margin do not always equal high net margins. In many cases, net margins run far lower than the gross margins due to the factors like interest expense and tax expenses. This means that even if the business can rejoin uh, rein its uh, cost of goods sold, other costs like administration, sales and interest payments can weigh down their bottom line. All right, so now let's study more about current ratio. What is current ratio and how it is calculated? We have seen gross margin ratio. Now we'll move ahead with current ratio. So what is current ratio? It is a liquidity ratio that measures a company's ability to pay short term obligations or those due within one year. It tells the investors and analysts how a company can maximize the current assets on its balance sheet to satisfy its current debt and other payables. A current ratio that is in line with the industry average or slightly higher is generally considered acceptable. A current ratio that is lower than the industry average may indicate a higher risk of distress or default. Similarly, if a company has a very high current ratio compared with its peer group, it indicates that management may not be using its assets efficiently. The current ratio is called current because unlike some other liquidity ratios, it incorporates all the current assets and the current liabilities. The current ratio is sometimes called the working capital ratio also but not in all the cases. So what are the takeaways from this? We'll study 
but first i just want to tell you about the formula and the calculation of the current ratio so current ratio is calculated by dividing the current assets to the current liabilities and current assets listed on company's balance sheet which include cash accounts receivables inventory and other current assets current liabilities includes accounts payable wages tax payables etc all right so the key takeaways for the current ratio is it compares all of a company's current assets to its current liabilities these are usually defined as assets that are cash or will be turned into cash in a year or less and liabilities that will be paid in a year or less the current ratio helps investors understand more about a company's ability to cover its short term debt with its current assets and make up apples to apples comparison with its competitors and peers one weakness of the current ratio is its difficulty of comparing the measure across industry groups others include the over generalization of the specific asset and the liability balances and the lack of trending information okay now we will see what is working capital so we have the working formula components and the limitations and everything on this page so working capital it is also known as net working capital it is a difference between company's current assets and the current liabilities and the formula to calculate the working capital is current assets minus current liabilities so what are the components of uh, working capital all the components of working capital can be found a company's balance sheet though a company may not have used all for the elements of working capital discussed below for example a service company that does not carry inventory will simply not factor inventory into its working capital calculation current assets listed include cash accounts receivables inventory and other assets that are expected to be liquidated or turned into cash in less than 1 year current liabilities includes accounts payables we have already uh, seen that it can be paid within the duration of one year all right so they have all uh, they have mentioned all the current assets and the current liabilities and its limitations so you can also read this out uh, for more information on working capital next it we will study about return on invested capital so this is the link for uh, return on invested capital and let's read about it so it is a calculation used to assess companies efficiency in allocating capital to profitable investments the return on invested capital formula involves dividing the net operating profit after tax which is also called as no pat by invested capital it gives us a sense of how well a company is using its capital to generate the profits comparing a company's roic with its weighted average cost of capital which is the wacc wac reveals whether invested capital is being efficiently used or not then what is the formula we have already discussed no pat divided by the invested capital these are some key takeaways from this discussion of return on invested capital moving ahead with debt to equity now this is also a very important ratio uh, in industries they often use it to make decision make uh, this is often used in decision making of debt and equity so the debt equity ratio is used to evaluate the company's financial leverage and is you and, and is calculated by dividing a company's total liabilities by its shareholders equity debt equity ratio is an important metric in corporate finance like i told you it is a measure of the degree to which a company is financing its operations with debt rather than its own resources debt equity equity ratio is a particular type of gearing ratio what are the key takeaways it compares the company's total liabilities with its shareholders equity and can be used to assess the extent of its reliance on the debt debt equity ratio vary by industry and are best used to compare direct competitors or to measure change in the company's reliance on debt over time among similar companies a higher debt equity ratio suggests more risk 
while a particularly low one may indicate a business is not taking advantage of debt financing to expand. Investors will often modify the debt equity ratio to consider only long term debt because it carries more risk than the short term obligation. What is the formula for debt equity ratio? The total liabilities divided by the shareholders equity. All right. The information needed to calculate the debt equity ratio can be found on a listed company's balance sheet. Subtracting the total value, subtracting the value of liabilities on the balance sheet from that of the total assets shown there provides the figure of shareholders equity, which is a rearranged version of this balance sheet equation. All right. So this was the last ratio which we had to discuss. Now moving with our application part and seeing all these calculations practically. All right. So as we have understood now the meaning of ratios drivers, why this is used and how these ratios helps a business in decision making and analysis of the financial statements, right? So basically let's start with the drivers in which I am uh, taking the DSO as a driver in my uh, as my driver and we are going to take this DSO and calculate the value of it. Let's uh, let me just show you the formula for it. I've already discussed the formula for it in that link, but in the application, let me just show you how we write the member formula for the particular driver. So this is the DSO member in which I have given the member formula. If the is member is actual or this is the function which I have used is member if is member is actual or is member forecast or is member plan, then divide the figures by these. So these are accounts receivables divided by like I told you in the formula. Uh, let, let me just show you. So this is the formula which we have used. Let me just copy this. All right, so this is the formula which is in my application and let's compare what are these members 11,000 because these are not the aliases. These are the actual member names which is uh, written over here. So at first we have this member. Which is. Receivables as we have discussed in our discussion of DSO. It is accounts receivables. The formula we have already discussed the accounts receivables divided by the revenue which I have mentioned over here. And now let's discuss this 41,000. It is the revenue. As you can see here, this contract revenue of so the intersection uh, which I have given over here with the total product divided by number of days in period intersection with no product and plus 45,000. These are other revenues. Let me just show you that. Other revenue divided by number of days in period in intersection with no product. So let's incorporate this formula and Calculate the value. I have already given it, but this is the intersection. This is the smart view of it in which I have already given the intersections and POVs. So, first, let's make it clear and calculate it again. Scenario is actual version is working. Product is no product. 
department is information system and entity is this all right refresh it keep it hash missing and then submit all right so in this way i have cleared this intersection of number of days in periods with no product all right which is in the denominator as you can see that all right i have cleared this intersection now what i'm going to do i am going to clear all these intersections All right. So currently in this year, FY22 in intersection with period December scenario is actual. HSP view is base data version is working. Product is iPhone 14 Pro Max and then department is 880. So this is the intersection for which I am calculating the DSO, which is the day sales outstanding and the formula I have given over here in the member formula. Right, so let's put the figures. So this is the intersection of 41,000 with total product. So 41,000 is my account for contract revenue. So let's put an amount over here of 1 lakh. Submit this. Next, I'm going to give the, um, uh, the number of periods in intersection with no product. So this is the driver which I'm going to place over here. So number of days in a period will be say, 30 or let's say supposed it is 20 for easy calculation. All right, then we have 11 triple one double zero. As an account member, which are which is the accounts receivable. So denominator is accounts receivables always while calculating the DSO. All right, so this is the member. This is the denominator. In which I am going to give some amount. So let's suppose this is one lakh fifty thousand. All right. So DSO is thirty days. So how this is calculating? First, 1 lakh divided by the driver, which was 20 over here, and this 5000 is getting divided by the denominator, which is 1 lakh 50,000. So, 1 lakh 50,000 divided by 5000 comes to 30 days. So, this is how a uh, day, day sales outstanding is, calculate, is getting calculated in at this intersection. All right, we can also create a form in this which will show us all the drivers and its values. So let's create a form for it. In this, we are going to create a simple form. Give the name. All right, then in layout, you need to select the intersections. So in rows, I'm putting account. In columns, I am giving entity. Product. All right. And also your and period. All right. So the HSP view is base data, scenario is actual. 
version is working. Department is IT. All right. Then in accounts. I am going to select. All the drivers. All the I descendants of predefined balance sheet drivers. This is my entity. Let's choose the product. F by 22 period is December. So since I am. You know explaining you all this, that's why I am using the scenario actual, but basically we all use this for forecasting the figures, right? So just I just want to give the demo of how this calculation work and how this is useful, but we cannot make any change to the historical figures, right? So just for our calculation part, I am telling you this, but we need to keep in mind that we always forecast and plan our figures. So when we'll preview it, we'll be able to see the DSO value over here, and if we we'll calculate any of these, we'll be able to see it in this. All right. So this is a, so any kind of change which happens, it will be shown over here. It will be re reflected in the data form. And on the basis of these data form, we can. Make the decisions and make the analysis. Right now going back to the application. Closing this. Now we have worked with one driver. Now we are going to work with the gross margin ratio. All right, we have various ratios over here for which we can work. Let's suppose. I'm taking quick ratio and see the formula for quick ratio. All right, so the member formula which is used in quick ratio is this. So assets minus this 14,000, whichever is these this account, then inventory and the whole divided by the liability. It must be the current assets divided by the total liability. So let's calculate the formula and by using these members, I'm going to calculate the quick ratio. Let's go to the smart view. Rename this this sheet. So I'm going to only use those members which are useful in calculating quick ratio. So that we can see clearly what kind of calculation and what kind of members we are using. Assets then. I'm going to give an amount in asset. Entity is. $2,000. 
choose any other product? So let's give the amount of the asset as two lakhs. Remove all the members from here. Just um, no, we need to give the inventory also. First, remove all these things. All right, so this is the inventory in which I'm going to put amount of 50,000 and I will submit this. All right, so my total assets are coming to 2,50,000, right? So the formula is assets minus the inventory is divided by the liability. So I'm going to give quickly an amount in liability. Of one lakh and I will submit this. So I have all the required figures to calculate the quick ratio over here. So as I just refresh this, I can see the quick ratio as 200% over here. All right. So how is this calculated? This is calculated by let me just show you the formula for it. Member formula we will go to plan one. All right, so the assets minus the inventory and divided by the total liability. So this is the denominator figure, numerator figure, then denominator is 1 lakh, which is this amount. And this numerator divided by denominator multiplied by 100, which comes to 200 percent, which is the amount which we are seeing in the quick ratio. All right, so this, this is how this figure gets validated. We can also create a form in this just to see any deviation, any kind of deviation in our ratios. So we'll go to forms and we can create a form over here with any kind of intersection, valid intersection with it. You can create a form with the name ratios. In the layout, give all the intersections account entity product period and year so in account you need to select what at what intersection you want this form So in this we have in KPIs we have the formula. So we can select this whole. All the I descendants of balance sheet KPIs. Select the entity. Select the product. Period is December. 
your FY22 scenario is actual. Department is information systems. Version is working. And HSP view is base data. Save this and preview this form where you can see the figures. As we saw in the. The ratio form is it says ratio form is invalid. It, there must be some issue with it. All right. Let's find this out. So as you can see here, the quick ratio is coming. There was some uh, problem with the intersection earlier. So this is how you can create a form and see any kind of variation deviation in the ratios. And. It will be very simple to make any kind of analysis and do the decision making process. All right. So that's all for today in which in today's session we have learned uh, what are these drivers? What are these ratios and how these helps an entity in decision making? All right, so that's all for today. Thank you and have a great day ahead.